Good evening. I'm Harriet Hamasi, University Librarian at Brown, and tonight's program is brought to you by the Brown University Library and the Friends of the Library. The first scene, chapter one of the first book, the chapter where they find the direwolf pups, just came to me out of nowhere. I was at work on a different novel, and suddenly I saw that scene. It didn't belong in the novel I was writing, but it came to me so vividly. They had to sit down and write it. And by the time I did it, it led to a second chapter. And the second chapter was the Caitlin chapter where Ned had just come back. Was this series that begot the, the TV series Game of Thrones, would you call it a happy accident? Oh, I don't know I'd call it an accident. Um, you know, I, I, I know some writers talk about inspiration that comes to them in, in, in these, these uh, very almost mystical terms about, uh, you know, muses and, and uh, uh, inspiration coming to you from strange places. I, I, it comes from us, it, it comes from the subconscious, whether right brain or left brain or some, some brain. Uh, but it, it is part of me. I mean, I, I read things, I digested things, that idea was buried somewhere, but it came to the surface and I, I don't know what makes it come to the surface. Uh, I don't know where, you know, you get off, asked often, uh, where do your ideas come from? And sometimes you know, sometimes there's a specific incident or an inspiration that generates an idea, but 90% of the time you, you don't know. It's just there's suddenly there's an idea and sometimes a whole story or a scene. And it wasn't there yesterday, but today it's there. And uh, where did it come from? I don't know. But I'm certainly glad that they keep coming because you're in trouble if they stop coming one of these days. Tom. A fantasy. This question is for you, George. So you've worked as a screenwriter for TV, uh, including on such really important fantasy shows as Beauty and the Beast uh, and The Twilight Zone. So how would you say that that screenwriting experience affects your writing, both for your novels and for your TV work? And you know, can you tell us about that TV work? What, what is your role? on the TV series, and what possibilities do you think television allows or maybe prohibits? Well, that covers a lot of ground. That's a big answer. Um, you know, my, my television career almost came about by accident. Uh, although I watched a lot of television as a kid growing up, I, I began with as a prose writer, selling short stories to magazines and selling my first novels. Um, you know, I, I was through the early 70s and into the late 70s and uh, the early 80s. I was a hot young star in science fiction and fantasy and horror, each book doing better than the one before, winning Hugos and Nebulas. Um, until I published that fourth book, the, <laughs> the one that John has held up, The Armageddon Rag, um, which got me my biggest advance yet, was supposed to be my first bestseller. Um, and it was a total commercial failure. Nobody, nobody bought it. And I discovered that uh, like almost overnight, my career as a publisher, as a novelist seemed to be over. Uh, I couldn't sell my fifth novel. Um, I sold a short story collection, Tough Voyaging, a fix up for like a 10th of the money that I'd gotten for the Armageddon rag. So it was almost like I was having to start all over. Um, but oddly enough, the same book that closed off my career as a novelist, opened my door to Hollywood because Armageddon Rank was optioned for a feature film by a guy named Phil Daguerre. He never got the feature made, although he tried for years. He wrote several screenplays. But Phil was also the television showrunner and, and creator who had done Simon Simon and some other hit shows. And uh, CBS came to him and said, well, we want more hit shows from you, Phil. What do you want to do next? He said, I want to bring back the Twilight Zone. And when he did, uh, he gave a lot of script assignments to science fiction, mm -hmm. fantasy, prose writers, people without any television or screenwriting experience whatsoever, which is very unusual. Um, and I was one of the lucky guys because he knew me through our association on Oregon Reg. And they liked the first script I wrote, and next thing I knew, I wound up on staff there. I did five scripts for Twilight Zone, a couple for Max Headroom that were never produced. Mm -hmm. Then I went on to be a staff on Beauty and the Beast for all three years of that show. Uh, and then after that, I did five years of development doing pilots. So basically, I spent a decade in, in television and film. I think it did, when I came back to prose, I came back with tools and techniques that I had picked up from television that I think helped me as a novelist and, uh, and a prose writer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, one of the things that people seem to like a lot, nice and fire, is the way each chapter leaves you wanting more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, that's a television technique. Yeah, that, that's a check. technique of the act break that I learned by working in television. You know, yeah. when, when you're gonna, you know, you, you got a television show going on and you're gonna have to cut to a commercial for, you know, beer or <laughs> cars or you know whatever. Uh, you want them not to change the channel, so you, you end with an act break, and it, it can be a cliffhanger, but it's. An oversimplification say it's always cliffhanging. Is it's a, a resolution of something or an introduction of a new element or a twist, just something really interesting to end the uh, the chapter with or the act with. Mm -hmm. And I applied that, that technique mm -hmm. to Game of Ice and Fire. So at the end of every chapter, there's there's something. There's a a, a twist, a turn, a resolution, um, an introduction of a new complication that will hopefully leave you wanting to find out what happens to Tyrion in the next chapter, but of course I don't give that to you. Uh, <laughs> then you have to read about Arya, or then you have to add, then you're, you're left at the end of the Arya chapter wanting to know what's going to be next for Arya, but now you have to deal with Jon Snow. So, <laughs> you know, that's a television to technique. I also think the years in television improved my dialogue. Um, if you compare my earlier novels, people were much more likely to give long, windy speeches, and uh, of course, that's very discouraged in television or film. You know, some of the some of the directors and the producers will just look at a page. They won't even read the dialogue. But if there's a big block that someone is giving a Shakespearean monologue, they hate it already. They want they want little two-line ping-ponging back and mm. kind of back and forth. And that's actually a better way. It's a livelier way to uh, to do dialogue, and it certainly had some influence on me in in that regard. Structure too, you know. William Goldman in his classic oh. book, Adventures in the Screenplay, yeah. said that he had two proverbs there that I took to heart. One is, uh, structure is everything, and uh, the other one is, uh, nobody knows anything. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> those are both true, oddly enough. Uh, Great, thanks. This, I think, kind of leads into yeah. the next uh, question that we were going to ask. So, I have a question that's actually for both of you that's about. The, I'm curious what you both think about the circulation of stories today in our era of multi-mediation, right? And I think that Song of Ice and Fire is really a key example of that. So not only is it a book series that obviously has been turned into a television series, but there's also you know, a great many other media texts that circulate around it, right? Dictionaries, wikis, maps, music videos, graphic arts, merchandise, et cetera, et cetera. So George, for you, I'm curious about what, do you, what does that mean to you as an author creating a fictional world where that world now exists in multiple forms? And then, you know, and, and of those multiple forms, I'm particularly curious to know what you think about the fan forms, fan rewritings, appropriations, remixing. So what does it mean for you as an author? And Tom, for you, well, it's, a, it's been an interesting experience, to, to say the least. I mean, when most of my career, um, writing books like The Armageddon Rag and Fever Dream and Dying in Light before that, or all of my short stories, did, there was no secondary rights. There was no subsidiary rights. Um, occasionally, I would get a movie option, you know, most of which just paid me some money and they held the rights for a year or two and then you'd never see a movie or something. I did occasionally get something filmed. My novella Night Flyers was made into a, a film at one point. Uh, I had a, a story called uh, Remembering Melody that would became an episode of The Hitchhiker. So occasionally something came through, but there were no other rights beside that. But then with, with uh, when Game of Thrones started becoming popular, Song of Ice and Fire, Suddenly, I started getting these uh, offers that I had never had before for, from various people who wanted to do replica swords or miniature figurines or, um, you know, Comic various book. types of games, uh, role-playing games, paper and pen role-playing games, and um, video games, and uh, just a bewildering number of things. And uh, I remember having through a period where I said, well, I don't know if I want to take any of these things. Some of them seem kind of tawdry. I, you know, I, I'm a serious writer. You know, would F. Scott Fitzgerald have ever uh, 
had bobblehead dolls. Uh, <laughs> and then I thought about it a little. I said, you know, from what I know of Scott Fitzgerald, he would have sold bobblehead dolls in a minute if they offered him any money for that. So he and uh, Zelda could have continued to party. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I signed these various contracts, and uh, um, I think they've both they've been good and bad things about it. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be just a guy who who signs a signs a contract, cashes the check. I wanted to make sure that if I, I was going to do these products, that they were good products, that they were true to the mm -hmm. material. So. Initially, I wrote in a lot of approvals to all of these things, that they could, they could do the game or they could do the whatever it is, but I would have to approve everything. And that sounds good in theory, but of course what it led to me spending a lot of time approving stuff, and, and not only approving, but giving notes on stuff. Uh, and I was probably a little obsessive about it at first, and it, it wound up taking a lot of my time. So I, I, I still don't want to let crappy products get out there, but I, I have pulled back a little on the approvals now that I know some of my licensees and who I can trust and who I can't trust. But the good part is that I discovered that there's an enormous synchronicity here yeah. because I, I've, my readership started to build yeah. from people coming in from other avenues saying, I'd never heard of your series, but I played the, the role-playing game, yeah. and uh, I loved the role-playing game. I thought I'd better look up the books, or, you know, I collected miniature figures and paint them, and I saw your figures that Dark Sword was doing, and I decided I'd better look up the books. So I was getting new readers from, from all of these things. It did cause a bit of a bump, uh, you know, with the uh, HBO deal, which came along a few years later, because, uh, you know, customarily, when you sell the rights to a TV or film company, they get all the merchandising rights. So HBO was saying, well, well, here's the deal, and, and we get all the merchandising rights. I said, I can't give you all the merchandising uh -huh. rights. I've already sold it to these other people. And what do you mean? We, we always get all the merchandising rights. And, you know, it, it wound up for a time that it was, looked like the whole deal was going to fall apart because, you know, even if I wanted to give them the merchandising rights, I couldn't because I had pre-existing contracts. But thankfully, my lawyers and agents were finally able to, to iron that out. But it was a ludicrous... But what do you Ludicrous think? negotiation, a point where it's saying, yes, well, we'll give you keychains, but we keep bobblehead dolls. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're going through all of that with the, uh, with the agent. Uh, and, and now that HBO is going, of course, uh, the, the, I still have the old contracts that are, that are grandfathered in um, that are still direct to me, but everything that's not under contract right. went to HBO. So now there's just a flood of merchandising coming out because nobody knows how to merchandise like a television network or a... Or a uh, film studio. So there, there are new products coming out all the time, including some I never would have thought, like oh. our own beer. I mean, it's great. We have our own beer. It's terrific. <laughs> what do you think about the ones that are not officially licensed? Again, like the fan appropriations and fan art, fan stories, fan rewriting. I, I've long been an opponent of fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I th and let me define fan fiction very precisely here, because sometimes I get criticized by people saying, you wrote fan fiction when you were young and now you criticize it, how dare you? I wrote what we called fan fiction in the 60s in comic fandom, but that was simply fiction written by fans right. and, and published without any money. Uh, and I certainly did a lot of that, but I never borrowed anybody else's character or world. I, I invented, I didn't, you know, I was a comic fan. I didn't write about Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. I, I created my own heroes, uh, you know, and wrote about them. The White Raider and Manta Ray and Garazan the Mechanical Warrior and all that stuff I was writing when I was 14 and 15. But they were my own characters and my own stories. What fan fiction has come to mean is writing Star Wars stories or writing Star Trek stories or, or writing, you know, slash fiction, which is, uh, you know, taking, taking characters and putting them together in, in unlikely sexual situations. Uh, uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me, so I, if, if people want to do that, fine, but don't, don't send it to me and expect me to prove it or something. Now, fan art, that's, that's fine, that's right. a whole, whole other thing. Um, fan art is great, and people do send me links to that all the time. Uh, 
some of this you just have to, what you want to do for your own amusement is great, yeah. but you can't start selling it on eBay or, or merchandising it, because yeah. then it, you'll get sued, if not by me, you'll get sued by one of my multiple makers of bobblehead dolls or, or figurines, <laughs> because you'll be moving into John one of the Smith, areas right. that they're paying me good money to, uh, to be into. Right. So. In that same LA Times article, George, the writer says, Martin, and this is, a, I wasn't going to go here, but you mentioned F. Scott Fitzgerald and, uh, you know, kind of a bobblehead for uh, Gatsby. Martin transports us back to the halls of power. And that's why A Song of Fire and Ice often feels less like a, san a fantasy saga and more like Doris Kearns Goodwin's team of rivals. How much has history influenced your writing? Um, in this series? Well, it's, it's influenced hugely. I mean, I, history was my minor in college. I've always loved uh, reading history, um, particularly medieval history, but I, I also read a lot of ancient history and occasionally other periods. Um, it's especially cool to read history about countries and times that I know nothing about, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the, you know, the same old stories that were taught uh, all through high school and college and such. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do when I started writing this series was to weld the, the, uh, the wonder and, and imagination of the, of the very best fantasy and, and science fiction with some of the grittiness of historical fiction. In addition to history, I read a lot of historical fiction. And um, for me, it fulfills some of the same stuff of fantasy. It takes us to another place, another time, place where mores were different um, and yet in historical fiction there's this uh, a sense of realism that uh, I found very attractive uh, and I'm a huge Tolkien fan certainly he was a giant influence over me um, but fantasy in in the hands of the imitators who followed Tolkien I think had kind of lost its way. They were, they were taking a lot of Tolkien's tropes and just repeating them. And they didn't have, Tolkien was a real scholar and, and a linguist and uh, an expert in folklore and ancient languages. And he brought all of this considerable learning to it. That wasn't true of the Tolkien imitators. They were taking just the broadest, you know, castles and knights and, and, and dark lords and stuff from Tolkien and producing this stuff that seemed to be me to be set in the Disneyland Middle Ages uh, rather than anything approximating the real Middle Ages. So, so history, you know, was, was huge for me. And as I read a lot of history, you know, uh, there's that famous quote that if you steal from one person is plagiarism, if you steal from many people is research. Uh, I, I stole from many people reading a lot of history and I would say to my wife as I read some of these histories, you can't make this stuff up. Listen to what happened here. And I'd read some incredible incident and then, you know, I'd file off the serial numbers and uh, change a few things and uh, do a version of that for my books. So something like the Red Wedding, as I've said in other interviews, was very much inspired by the Black Dinner of Scotland and the Glencoe Massacre, both from Scotland. Scotland has a lot of incredibly bloody history, uh, which is uh, particularly particularly good. Of course, the War of Roses was a huge influence over everything, the Hundred Years War. Um, all of that was, was Christopher the Mill. So in addition to historical references, do you believe, do you also think of uh, Song of Ice and Fire as, uh, as kind of relating to current? Does it function not only as historical reference in some ways, but political allegory, right, in the way that your work deals with issues of you know, war and peace, uh, family loyalties or national divisions. How do you, you know, and there is a long history of science fiction and fantasy functioning as sort of historical allegory, political allegory. Do you, do you think your work functions in that way? Well, I, I think some of that is probably there, but it's not necessarily there deliberately. I, I think you're obviously you're influenced as a writer by the world you live in and uh, the things you see on the news and, and the forces that have shaped you from your childhood to that. All of that goes in and 
it comes out in some ways, but I'm not writing conscious allegory. Mm -hmm. Tolkien was accused of that, of course. It always made him very angry because he mm -hmm. hated allegory. Um, but, you know, he, when people said, well, the Lord of the Rings is an allegory for World War II, he, he rejected it vehemently. Um, but there's no doubt that I think some of that, um, mm -hmm. some of that is there. Yeah, some of this is just universal concerns. I mean, I'm writing about power, I'm writing about right. governance, I'm writing about war. Um, yes, there are differences, but the things that are true about the war in Iraq are also true about Caesar's invasion of Gaul and, and Alexander's conquest of Persia. There are certain universals that, that, that go all through history, and uh, those are inevitably present. Mm -hmm. you know, to, again, to George's, kind of continues on the issue of the political implications. So for all the enormous interest and lauding of your work, certainly deservedly so, there have also been some critiques, I'm sure you know, of the series, by which I mean both the book series and the TV series, political and social implications. Now, in many ways, we could say that the series really kind of undermine traditional notions of power, that, that they really, in some ways, very much play with, you know, as we've talked about, about phallic constructions of power, kind of subverting it. But at the same time, you know, there has been some critique of the works in terms of issues of gender and sexuality and race. So, for example, with the TV series, it even led to the, con the coinage of a new term, sex position, Right, which people talk about it, kind of laugh about the way that sometimes there'll be uh, these scenes with, with sexual activity or nudity to kind of prevent the information of narrative, kind of narrative information from seeming boring, that you have the sex going on. So some people say, okay, so women and sexual minorities are there for just kind of titillation purposes and not much else. And there have also been some critique of some of the racial tropes, for instance, using the trope of the kind of white savior of dark people, like in the case of Daenerys Targaryen. So I'm curious, do you think that these critiques are justified? How do you respond to those critiques? Well, you're, that question covers a lot of territory. Uh, Good time, the professor here. <laughs> there, there are. Uh, let me try to separate that into component parts here. First of all, you have to separate the books from the television right. show. They're, they're, they're two different things. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very, uh, very, very clear, as in the case of uh, this white savior business right. with the, the scene with Daenerys, um, where she is uh, hailed by the, uh, the slaves that she's just freed in the city of Yunkai. Um, that scene is drawn largely from the books, but in the, in the books, I, I think I make it very clear that uh, the slavery of uh, Slaver's Bay of Yunkai and Astapur and Marine is not racially based. Mm -hmm. It's not American um, slavery, uh, which was strictly race-based. It's modeled much more on the, the slavery of the ancient Near East of the Romans and the, and the Greeks. Uh, where slaves could be of any race, um, you know, it could just be the guys who lost the last war. Um, you know, the Greeks enslaved each other. You know, if Thebes defeated Athens in a war, a bunch of Athenians would suddenly be slaves in Thebes and vice versa. Um, the Romans conquered people of various colors in Africa and, and very different covers and colors in Germany and Gaul and made slaves of them all. Um, and that's certainly what I depict in the books. Uh, and I think that's what is meant to be depicted in the TV show, too. But there are practicalities with running a TV show. Mm -hmm. those, those scenes were filmed in Morocco. Um, and the people that you see are extras mm -hmm. who are paid, you know, $30 a day or something like that to, uh, to perform. Um, just to be in the background. Um, when you film that, you, the practicalities are you put out a call for extras and mm -hmm. people show up and, uh, and you sign up as many as you need. Um, when you do that in Morocco, Moroccans show up right. and... <laughs> So 
I don't know what the, I mean, obviously there's an implication there that uh, people took of it, perhaps people who had not read the books, yeah. um, that all of the people that she freed were, were brown or black, and that's yeah. certainly not the, was not intended to be the case. But yeah. on the other hand, flying in people from, uh, um, from Ireland to, in order to yeah. people this scene in Morocco just to stand in the crowd would have been uh, very, very cost prohibitive. Yeah. These are the kind of practicalities of television yeah. uh, production that, that some critics never take into advantage. I mean, if you look at the Dothraki, for example, we, we filmed these Dothraki scenes with Daenerys in a number of different places. And, you know, like some of the early scenes, our, our main location is Belfast in Northern Ireland, and we film in areas around Belfast. Now, Danny in particular has filmed scenes in Morocco, in Malta. Uh, she's filming some in Spain right now. We, we move around, um, but some of the early Dothraki scenes when she was first with Khal Drogo were actually filmed in, in the fields outside Belfast in Northern Ireland yeah. in, in forests and grasslands. And if you look at those closely, there's a lot of kind of pasty white Dothraki yeah. uh, <laughs> because those are the guys who showed up when we put a yeah. casting call. Yeah. Hey, do you have long hair? Can you ride a horse? And, uh, you know, you hire who you show up. And with gen I mean, that scene, you know, with, with Daenerys too, I mean, it ties to the gender issues. I know what you're saying about the differences between the TV show and the book, that it's very different, let's say, the issues of sexual violence that are in the TV program are not like the scene, you know, that it is not a rape of, of Danny in, in your book. And I know that, so I, I understand exactly what you're saying about the, 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 between the difference between the television and, but as, a, you know, but you're also an executive producer of the TV series. Do you have, can you kind of negotiate those things with them or, you know, how does that work to say, I, I don't like the way you're, you're translating this? You know, I'm involved in a television show, but it's, it's really run by David Benioff and, and mm -hmm. Dan Weiss. Um, you know, and I don't consult every day. I'm not. I'm not in Belfast. I'm. I'm. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in Santa Fe, trying to half a world away, trying to finish my book. So I do consult with them. They, we talk regularly. They sometimes ask my opinions, and sometimes they don't. Um, but I don't think in the, in that particular case I would have done anything different. I mean, they, frankly, it, I don't even think I realized there was a problem there until people started pointing out there was a problem. Maybe that's my blindness or the blindness of David and Dan, but it was just, you know, the practicalities if you're going to do that scene. I mean, how do you, how do you get that? Where, where do you get the, the mixed racial things when you're trying to hire a thousand extras for a scene mm -hmm. and you're doing it in Morocco? I, I, I don't know. You know, do you use CGI to, to change their complexion or uh, mm -hmm. do, you know, do you say we have enough brown people? Sorry, we're not hiring any more of you brown people. Uh, you know, people. Uh, only white people should. I, I don't know. I don't know how you, how you do that. but. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there is a better way, and we should have thought about it more, but uh, I don't know that. Now, let me go to another part of that question, which is the sex position question. That was a, that was a very <laughs> cool uh, coinage, mm -hmm. uh, which was coined by, uh, I think it was Miles Nutt, the yes, critic it was. Miles Nutt, yeah. for referring to a, one particular scene. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think it was probably justified for that particular scene. Littlefinger is giving a long speech in the brothel, and meanwhile there's, there's right. a, a couple girls getting it on in the background. And, uh, <laughs> and it was parodied on Saturday Night Live and all that. But I, I do think that, like many of these tropes that uh, Odie's Cornish has come forward, it's, it's been met vastly misused. People who don't seem to un actually understand the scene have started applying it to any scene that has sex. Mm -hmm. I don't think sexuality is sex position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, s sex position was that one particular right. thing where they're trying to put something, um, I guess, visually interesting on, on, right. on the scene while, they're, while someone is delivering, a, you know, a long nugget of uh, backstory. Right. Um, George, let me, let, let me come at this from a different way because there's another side to your characters, another side to what you're doing. As you illuminate in your Rolling Stone interview from, a, from maybe about a year ago, you deride the fact that fantasy is mostly inundated with evil, ugly, dark lords who, who go to battle with dashing, brave heroes. And you've kind of turned that paradigm upside down. I'm going to have a follow-up to Tom on this in a second. Your books feature a dwarf as, as a major character, if not the, the sole, the most reasonable voice, 
a disabled boy, uh, many of the characters, uh, a, a prostitute plays uh, several seem to be wise and heroic. You have a character who commits in the first book and the first season of the show an irredeemable act who is now in the since he's lost a, a limb is becoming almost I, I, I hesitate to say heroic and yet that's what it is. Um, you seem to have changed the nature of heroism as it has been traditionally defined in fantasy and science fiction. Is that something you set out to do consciously or did, just, did, or did it evolve? Did characters like Tyrion Bran um, and Jamie Lannister, did they just evolve organically? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I've always been attracted to great characters. Um, I think they're more interesting than, uh, than heroes, you know, who are just going around being heroic all the time. Is that why, by taking Jamie's hand away, he becomes a more sympathetic character and, and seeks redemption instead of continuing on the path he was on before? Well, he certainly has to redefine himself, and, and in that comes a lot of personal anguish and, and personal growth and personal struggle, all of which is, you know, great material for, uh, for drama. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up as a comic book fan, as I mentioned. That was my, my first stuff was published in comic fanzines. And uh, a huge influence on me when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old was, was uh, Stan Lee and the Marvel comics. And that was one of the things he did, you know. I'd, I'd been reading DC Comics for years when Marvel started. And uh, the DC stories were all completely circular, you know. Was, Batman was swinging around Gotham City and, you know, here comes the Riddler or the Joker. And he defeats the Riddler and the Joker and they go in. But there's never any surprises. The story ends right where it begins so next week he can deal with Poison Ivy or whatever. And um, you always knew who the heroes were. You always knew who the villains were. Um, and Stan Lee th threw all that out. He, That's right. He, 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 you know, the Fantastic Four, what a revelation that was in 1961. You know, one of, one of the guys on the team was a monster. And he didn't like being a monster. And he was angry at the other people on the team. They were fighting within each other, just as League never fought within each other. And I discovered, really, the, the powers of conflict and the powers of great characters. And they continue to, I mean... I love Lord of the Rings, and I think Boromir is my favorite character. He's the one who, who succumbs, you know. He's a mm. hero, but he's also fatally flawed. And, uh, you know, he, he fails at the last moment. And, and, you know, you're rooting for him, but then... <sighs> and Peter Jackson did a great job in the movie. We're showing his temptation. You really, you really like Boromir, but, you know, then he turns against Frodo, corrupted by the ring, but then he dies so heroically, full of arrows. Yeah. Sean Bean dying one of his many deaths. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I love to write about characters like that, and intellectually I always, I also, I also find the question of, of redemption fascinating. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not religious now, but I was raised a Catholic, so maybe it's, Maybe it's uh, questions that, I, uh, that come to me from my whole Catholic upbringing and the, the things I learned from uh, nice. Sister Mary Elephant or something in catechism. I, I mean, you know, the, the whole question of forgiveness for sin, you know, that the Catholic Church teaches you go to confession and you are forgiven for your sins, even terrible sins. Um, but certainly our society doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily deal with that. Uh, we, we, we don't forgive people. Even I don't forgive people. I recognize, you know, I'm a great character myself here, I, you know. As some of you know, follow my, my uh, blog. I'm a, I'm a football That's fan. I'm a, I'm a fan of the Giants and the Jets. But it, it bothers me that Michael Vick is on, my, is on my Jets team. And I know he's paid his debt to society and all that, but I can't just bring myself to root for this guy. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and then um, people yeah. say, well, what about your belief in redemption? Well, yeah, I know, but <laughs> it's still, it's hard. It's hard. You know, Tom, what, what we were sort of... Actually, I should... Try to I should talk about the next book. I should tell you that uh, uh, I actually have three books coming out this month, so uh, none of them are the winds of winter. But uh, <laughs> we do have uh, the Ice Dragon, uh, which uh, my my children children's book, uh, which has an older book, but it's just been reissued by Tor in hardcover, beautiful new edition with artwork by Louis Royal, and that came out a couple days ago. 
and the Dangerous Women paperback, the first volume, because it's a really big book and hardcover. That comes out uh, when? That comes out in a few days, right? Actually, that is shipping now. It will be shipping in some now. stores. Okay. <laughs> and then on October 28th, uh, The World of Ice and Fire comes out, a giant, heavily illustrated coffee table book from Bantam Spectra hardcover um, with all of the background and information about Westeros, art on every page, gorgeous art, and uh, tons of uh, history uh, about. You can read the Armageddon Rag. And yeah, you can read the Armageddon Rag too. You can be one of the 12. <laughs> <laughs> So no, that's in print now. All my old books have come back in print, so uh, you can get them. But they're not coming out this month. So what we wanted to do to try, because I know a lot of people have questions. So first of all, try to keep your questions relatively brief. What we wanted to do was hear, a question, hear questions from both sides. In other words, you ask and you ask. So they hear both questions. Starks, because, Lannisters. <laughs> because sometimes Lannisters. No other way. <laughs> All right, let's let it start. So we're going to hear both questions first because sometimes questions sure. overlap and then they'll no, answer and then we'll move on. So, Lannister, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, have you or yeah? Have you um, read anything that made you think differently about fantasy or science fiction, either or both? Okay. And your question would be. And my question is: You have such a brilliantly realized world, but. You've also called yourself more of a gardener as a writer, so I guess my question is, how much of Westeros was planned as a setting prior to even the beginning of the first draft? Um, almost none. I mean, when that first chapter came to me, I, I didn't know what I had. I knew it didn't fit the, the science fiction novel I was presently writing. Um, so I knew it was in some fantasy, but I didn't have a name for it, and I, I didn't know anything. But I continued to write the first few chapters. At some point, I stopped and drew, drew a map. That's kind of, I, I knew when I was doomed, uh, when I drew the first map. But uh, I am a gardener rather than an architect, and, and uh, the, the world has grown together with the, with the story. Um, there are times I almost wish, uh, some of you have probably read Gene Wolfe, the absolutely brilliant science fiction and fantasy writer from, from Chicago, author of the, uh, the oh, many books, Book of the New Sun, and uh, was one of his best, and it started as a trilogy, ended up in four books. I was in a writer's group with Gene when he was writing that, and Gene had a full-time job as an as a editor for a, a technical magazine, and he wrote all four of those books in first draft before he submitted any of it to the publisher, and then having finished all four books, he went back and revised the first one, you know, put in some foreshadowing of things that had happened in the fourth book that he didn't know when he was writing the first book, eliminating loose ends that led nowhere, you know, just making them, and that's really the way to write a long series, but, uh, you know, and, and as part of me that, you know, if I had, if I had been a billionaire with a huge trust fund, uh, I might have done that, but then none of you would have read any of the books because I'd, I'd still be working in book five and Game of Thrones wouldn't be released yet because I'd be holding it to go back uh, when I finished all seven. So, uh, you know, but it, it grows, it, for me, it grows, the world grows along with the stuff. I did have to, when putting together this world book, The World of Ice and Fire, uh, really focus in and I invented a lot of new material for that, a lot of background that. The, uh, the fans and readers had sent me emails and letters about, you guys are insatiable. I mean, it's, it, it's like, you know, I, I do a family tree with like eight generations, and then like a week later I get, well, who was, who was the father before that first generation? <laughs> I mean, am I supposed to go back to the Westeros Adam and Eve? I don't know, I guess so, but. <laughs> and did, did, yeah. Uh, did, did you have an answer for, did, did you want to reiterate? Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Have you read anything, both of you, um, that uh, made you think differently about fantasy? Um, I've read a lot of great fantasy. I think this is a golden age for, uh, for fantasy. I mean, uh, we have a lot of wonderful new fantasists. Daniel Abraham with The Dagger and the Coin, Patrick Rothfuss, Scott Lynch, uh, Joe Abercrombie. These are all writers that I really, really, really like and, and uh, admire. Um, so they're doing some amazing stuff. Yeah, Tom, and from your from thing, things that's happening in, in uh, both fantasy and science fiction right now, um, is we're we're seeing a lot of new writers coming into the field, um, who are from a different cultural and ethnic background. Uh, you know, people who are Asian or African American or or just African or or. 
um, you know, from many different cultures. And their drawing on, you know, it's often been pointed that a lot of epic fantasy has its roots, like Tolkien, in, in the European Middle Ages or the European Dark Ages. And that's certainly been true of the overwhelming amount of material. But I, I think that's starting to break down, and we're, we're getting some interesting books by some interesting writers. Look at the people being nominated for the Campbell Award the last few years, uh, much broader. So we're getting more diversity into the field now. Whether that is going to succeed or not, um, some of that's up to the writers and how good those books are, but a lot of it's also up to you. Um, you know, are you going to support these writers? Are you going to buy their books and review their books and, mm -hmm. and uh, create the, the blurb about their books? And if so, we're going to have an explosion, I think, of, of fantasy that's uh, much, more, much more diverse and, and maybe it won't seem quite so familiar. I mean, I, I base my work on the history that I knew, the history that I was taught and that I'd read numerous about, like War of the Roses and all that. I don't know a huge amount about Asian history. Um, someone coming in, drawing from a Japanese perspective or an Indian perspective, uh, um, would produce something very different. And I, I look forward to reading books like that. And I think we're going we're gonna to get a lot more of that moving forward. All right, all right let's hear Thank the next you. set of questions from the next people. The Starks in the land. The Starks. Hi. Um, after having worked on the TV series, do you find that when you're writing, you you have images from the show of what the characters look like or the places look like, or is it entirely separate in your mind? That's a great question. And your question would be? Um, my question was, you admitted you really like your great characters. I was wondering if it's easy for you as an author to kind of kill off or let go of black oh. and white characters. <laughs> They're pure good or pure evil. Are they somehow a little bit uh, easier to maybe write and easier to bump great. off? Great. Those are kind of connected. Want to get both of those? Um, I, I, I do get attached to my characters, and sometimes it is hard to kill them off. Uh, I've, I've said before that the Red Wedding was the hardest thing I ever wrote. I finished that entire book, and I had to skip over that chapter. I couldn't write that chapter until the rest of the book was finished. Wow. I, okay, now I've got to go back and finally write that chapter, and I, I made myself write it, but it was painful. These mm -hmm. characters assume a certain reality to me. Mm -hmm. And on the same token there, uh, no, the TV show does not affect my images of the characters. I recognize that it does so for you for the readers and the viewers. Uh, you probably see, when you read the books, you see Peter Dinklage. When you read Tyrion, you see Maisie Williams. When you read Arya, and they're both sensational at their parts, as are many of our cast. But you gotta remember, I've been living with these characters since um, 1991. And we had the first meeting about the TV show in 2007, so there were, there were 16 years that I was living and writing about those characters in that world before the TV show was even a, a, a twinkle in, in the eye of HBO. So uh, that's too deeply rooted to replace it for me. Great. All right, next up. Yeah, do you um, so one of the most great and terrible things about A Song of Ice and Fire is its unpredictability. So how has the expanded reader base affected your ability to keep up uh, that sense of excitement or um, sort of the ability to predict or not predict things that are going to happen in the series? And for, for George, I know you don't uh, directly are involved with the, the goings on with the show right now, but I just wanted to get your opinion on exactly how the show has deviated from your own writings and how well you think that should continue or not continue. I always think of Tyrion's nose when, I, when, I, when someone asks that question. So that, predictable. Tyrion's nose is a good example. I mean, yeah, they didn't cut off his nose. Uh, I, I can write that, you know, that, yes, and they cut off his nose, and then I can make references in the subsequent books to him having half a nose or having a big scar and to how it itches and he scratches it. That's relatively easy for me to do. Actually, cutting off Peter Dinklage's nose uh, was prohibited by the Actors Guild. Uh, 
so we were, we were stuck with, uh, well, if we wanted to do that, we would have to essentially put a piece of green screen, uh, a little green uh, kind of thing on the end of his nose that he would have to wear in all of his scenes, and then we could CGI every moment he appeared, uh, you know, the, the nose scar, um, and that was just way too expensive. Yes. I mean, it's the practicalities of... Uh, yeah of doing it again. Uh, you know, a lot of the changes that occur between a, a movie or a television show or book are, are dictated by practical considerations like that, questions of budget and shooting time and what can be done and uh, what, what can't be done. Um, and I'm already forgetting the other question. I'm sorry, my mind is a sieve here. How the expanded reader base has affected your ability to write things that are unpredictable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure it's the expanded reader base that has uh, affected things so much as the internet. But basically, I have to I have to divorce myself from the internet. I mean, I know it's out there, and I know people have theories. And sometimes at venues like this, people come up and tell me their theories. Uh, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, when you when you're when you're writing a, a book, um, you know that has any kind of surprises or mysteries. You know you lay in certain clues that let us say the butler did it, and um, it's a long series. You you lay in the clues in the first one, and you have more clues, and maybe a few red herrings and subsequent ones. Mm -hmm. And most readers will not miss that. They will they will not figure out who did it. They will not even be cognizant there's a mystery or they will put together the clues wrong but there will always be some and this has always been true there will always be some who put the clues together and figure out that the butler did it what's changed in the eyes of the internet is now that smart ass feels that they can go on the internet and say oh here are the seven clues that i found and see the butler did it <laughs> so if you're a writer and you're aware of that then you have what do you do? Now your surprise is ruined because suddenly this person has put it out and now thousands of people have read it and they're all saying, oh yeah, you're right, I didn't see that, but yeah, the butler did do it. So you can change the subsequent books Very and the butler didn't do it now. Now the, the chambermaid did it, but, but then all your clues that you put in so carefully in the first <laughs> and second book lead to nowhere and they're, they're, they're contradictions. So I, I don't do that. I, you know. I'm sorry, but the butler is still going to do it at the end, and <laughs> some people will have figured that out, I think, and other people who didn't figure it out will know it because they read it on the internet in one of these theory swapping things, and there's no help for that. Uh, there's a structure to the things that you have to be true to. Um, I console myself in the fact that I, I do have millions of readers, and as, as big and noisy as the internet seems, it's still relatively small in the cosmic theme of things. So there will be, at the end, there will still be many, many thousands of people who will be shocked to find out that the butler did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next set. Uh, this one is also for George. Um, whenever you... <laughs> Sorry. Um, we whenever... some questions for Tom here. <laughs> He's getting off easy. <laughs> um, right, some Tom folks come up and get in line. Whenever you, um, if you do, hit bumps in the road or roadblocks with character plots or like traits or whatever, um, how much of that do you draw from your personal life in order to create a more in-depth character or scene or relationship? Okay, yours is? Um, a Song of Ice and Fire is a very, very long, well, it's a fairly long-running series of very long novels. And people who read these, who have been reading these novels since the beginning have developed a Kind of a feel, I feel they must have developed a, series, a feeling of trust that you're going to be leading them to somewhere that ultimately has a very good payoff. Do you feel that with the immense number of people you kill per book that you could violate that trust? Immense. <laughs> <laughs> so those go together, you know, in terms of the pers your personal experiences and then also the personal feelings of the readers. So. Well, I hope I don't violate that trust, but... Uh... You know, I, I, I've kind of become accustomed to the fact that some people probably will think I have by the time we reach the end. You know, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of a, of a, of a long-running series like this when, you know, P 
people n start noticing it with the first book or the second book or the third book, and then, then they love those books, and the fourth book's not out yet, and they start anticipating the fourth book. And they, this platonic ideal of what that fourth book is going to be develops in their head, and then they get the actual fourth book, and many people are happy with it, but then there's always going to be a percentage of readers who are not happy with it, because it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go, or it wasn't as as whatever it was they thought it was. So you, you inevitably come come on that with the series. But I certainly want to try to uh, stick the ending as, uh, as best I can. Um, it's not easy. I mean, I'm not going to name names here, but we, over dinner we were discussing some other writers and, and you know, some very, very good writers have a real problem with endings. Endings can be, can be tough, you know, especially for big, sprawling things. You pull out a lot of stuff. As for the question about, uh, yes, um, you do draw on your personal experience to make characters come alive to, to some extent. Um, that's, that's where the inner life comes from. That, that's where the human heart and conflict with self comes from. Um, I was very threatened as a kid uh, when I knew I wanted to be a writer by the stuff you always read in like how to write books and things like only write about what you know. Um, because I wanted to write science fiction and fantasy and I, I didn't really know about being a prince or an astronaut or, you know, I was this kid from New Jersey and we, we, we were poor, we didn't even own a car. I, I, my, my world was five blocks long and I was saying, oh God, do I have to write about a guy who lives in Bayonne and the projects and walks to school every day five blocks long? But um, what I discovered is that what you know it's not the mundane details of uh, you know where you live and and what it is, but it's it's what you know is about life, about love, about about uh, heroism and cowardice and and these issues. Uh, what it's like to be human, and and you have to you have to draw on yourself to do that. Yeah, you draw on other things too. You read you read you know characters from history, and you read people in the news, and you have friends and relatives and guys guys you went to school with and girls you went to school with, and you can base characters on all of them to some extent, at least externally, but you only know those people, unless you're a telepath, and, and you don't look like a telepath to me. You, you don't really know what's going beyond the, behind these, these masks. The only one you really know is yourself. And, uh, you know, I think to be a significant writer, there's a, a, you have to be willing to kind of expose yourself and, and uh, Dig, dig deep and, you know, as Harlan Ellison would say, bleed on the paper or something like that. And that's a lesson I learned early on that's, uh, that stood me in, in good stead. Um, I write a lot of, about a lot of characters and none of them are kids from Bayonne. Uh, so obviously I'm not writing about what I know in that sense. I, I, I've never been an exiled princess. I've never been an eight-year-old girl. I've never been a dwarf. Um, but there's a lot of me in all those characters. I mean, it's you know, I I think what would what would it be like if I was an eight-year-old girl in Arya's situation? What would it be like if I was if I was Daenerys Targaryen or Tyrion Lannister? How would it feel? And I I do put a lot of myself into that. Thank you. Okay, so next set, uh, can I just say too, if anybody has a question for Tom, come to the front of the line. <laughs> but, Yes. <laughs> uh, before I ask my question, Mr. Martin, I'd really like to thank you for writing the books. They've had a huge impact on my life, Mom, so thank you. Um, my question is, how do you think that the success of the entire A Song of Ice and Fire universe has influenced the way that you're writing the future books? Okay. Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one's really quick. Um, first, <laughs> what are your favorite house words? Um, and then also, um, I assume you quickly developed a final outcome for the story after originally creating it, uh, but at some points you also made changes like uh, the inclusion of like a five-year gap. Um, so I was wondering if there were any other major deviations or character choices that you made and later thought better of. Uh, my favorite house words are definitely winter is coming. That's the one I, I write, uh, you know, repeatedly uh, when I'm... Uh, when I used to do inscriptions uh, on signed books. Um, I haven't actually gotten to the end yet, so I don't know if there are going to be other major changes. 
it's it's possible, but I, I don't. I think the broad outlines are going to remain the same. You know, I I know where some of the major characters are going, how they're going to end up, how it's going to resolve. But there are a, the devil is in the details, and there's a lot of stuff that occurs when you're actually writing the the books. I don't know. You you dealt with some of this. Uh, I'm, I'm you and Harriet with with. Jordan, I'm sure. Uh, Jim always said that he, he knew the last scene yep. uh, when he wow. when he started. So did did he entrust that to Harriet, and did Brandon write the last scene that, that uh, Jim had originally envisioned? Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. And that was like 20 years later, right? 20 years later. But of course, then he was thinking it was going to be a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm You're already concerned. forgetting the first question. Yeah. I, I keep forgetting there's two questions at a time. I, I'm old and, and feeble, so. <laughs> How do you that? think the uh, success of the entire universe has influenced the way that you write the future novels? Um, I don't think it's influenced the way I write the future novels, but it's, it, it's certainly been a distraction. I probably would have written the novels faster if I wasn't like always approving things or going on tours or uh, you know doing coming to Brown doing other coming to Brown uh, yeah <laughs> to to do that I mean there's just there's just a lot of other things and you know some of it is is good stuff it's stuff I enjoy enjoy doing I know there's a subset of my fans that would like to just chain me to the typewriter uh, <laughs> And if no one was giving me awards or in offering me free trips to, to Dubai and, and uh, South Africa, maybe, you know, maybe I would do that. But at, when I actually settle down and, and write you know, between these trips here, and I mean, I'm trying to, I swear I'm trying to cut down on all of this. But when I'm actually there writing, um, it, it's, it's like time vanishes. And I'm, I'm, back, I'm back once again in, in uh, Westeros. And, the real world disappears, and uh, days and weeks go by, and I, I don't do anything else except live and breathe those characters, and it's that's still pretty much the same process. Everything vanishes, including the show. As uh, much as I love the show, it's it's different from the books, and um, so it's the books and the the characters as I interpreted them that take over my life. Guest and our interviewers.